Welcome to the Animal Wellness Podcast, all about improving the lives of animals with better policies and practices in government and business. Brought to you by Animal Wellness Action, where we believe helping animals helps us all. Here's your host, Joseph Grove. Shoes are not shoes! Your mama should have swallowed you! Get out, get out with all that. Get out with all that. Break your whole phone. Wear your Wear your that cacophony was recorded at a recent protest at an Adidas store in New York City. Troublemaker Donnie Moss of TheirTurn.net, someone I admire and who is a friend to Animal Wellness Action, made that video. You can hear the passion of the voices of the advocates who turned out in large numbers to remind Adidas, its store employees, shoppers, and passersby that kangaroos are not shoes. We'll put the link to that video in our show notes. It's worth a watch. My favorite parts are when one Adidas employee threatens to smash Johnny's phone and another when one of the employees gives the middle finger to the camera. Classy stuff, Adidas. But then again, what can one expect from a company that believes it's okay to gun down kangaroos in the dead of night and then bludgeon to death the joeys still in their pouches, about half a million of which are killed each year. And that's the focus of this show. Kangaroos are not shoes. It is the name of a campaign started a few years ago by Animal Wellness Action and the Center for a Humane Economy, and it's one that's made significant progress in protecting the iconic Australian marsupial from the depravity of those nighttime hunts. First, Puma agreed to stop selling soccer shoes or cleats made from the skins of dead kangaroos. Next, Nike heard our voices and those of the many protesters at its stores and made a similar decision. But more work is to be done. Adidas continues retailing products made from slaughtered kangaroos, and for the moment at least, so do New Balance and other brands. Recently, it occurred to our guests that it's perhaps too easy for Adidas, for example, to ignore the disquiet in its own living room. Perhaps, our guests believe, taking the fight to other retailers, third-party chains who might not so well tolerate the disruptions, would be more effective. Hence, on Tuesday, the Don't Be a Dicks initiative was launched by Animal Wellness Action and the Center for a Humane Economy. It is designed to bring to public attention the fact that the country's largest sporting goods retailer, Dick's Sporting Goods, is one of the major resellers of kangaroo-sourced soccer shoes in the world. Dick's has about 780 stores across the country, and its website markets soccer plates from Adidas, New Balance, Mizuno, and others. Here to talk about our Kangaroos Are Not Shoes campaign and the new Don't Be a Dicks initiative are Jennifer Skiff and Kate schultz Barton. Jennifer is the Director of International for the organizations and the author of several books, including The Divinity of Dogs, Rescuing Ladybugs, and God Stories. She holds dual citizenship with the United States and Australia and lives in both countries. She was in Australia during the catastrophic bushfires of 2019 to 2020, and she's going to talk a little bit about that experience. Kate is the group's senior attorney and was the staff attorney of the Animal Law Litigation Clinic, part of the Center for Animal Law Studies of Lewis and Clark Law School. Before that, Kate was an assistant district attorney for five years at the Queens County District Attorney's Office in New York City, where she specialized in investigating and prosecuting crimes against animals as part of the office's Animal Cruelty Prosecutions Unit. Both are leaders of the Kangaroos Are Not Shoes campaign. Before we get started, uh, I want to ask our producer, Ryan, to play the the audio from our new Don't Be a Dicks campaign. This is Dicks. This is a kangaroo. Dicks is the largest sporting good retailer in America and sells a variety of shoes with kangaroo skins. Kangaroos are slaughtered by the millions to be used to make those shoes. Only a Dix would sell shoes made from dead kangaroos. Don't be a Dix. We'll link the video, but I like the sound of the message of it. So all that said, Jennifer and Kate, uh, welcome to the show. Glad you're, you're with us. I think you've both been on our shows before, so it's good to have you back again. Jennifer, let's start with you. Um, talk about how you got involved with the Kangaroos Are Not Shoes campaign. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. And I will say that... Um, I got involved probably 28 years ago when I started living in Australia during the winter. And, uh, you know, and when I wasn't there living in Maine uh, in the United States in the summer. Um, 
And I got to know very quickly and the Australian landscape and the beauty of it and the kangaroos and everyone there uh, had pretty much has an affection. The Australians have an affection for their kangaroos. I remember sitting at a family winery and just sitting outside as the sun was setting and the kangaroos would just come up to us and graze beside us uh, as we were having a glass of wine. It was just a, a very beautiful experience. At the same time, um, I understood and learned to understand that they were shot. Uh, and it, it always seemed so strange to me because everyone there seemed to love them so much and loved having them around. But as in um, most instances around the world uh, where animals are prosecuted, base, basically, um, they affected, you know, agriculture. They competed and they compete there uh, for water. And, uh, and so at times they're shot. They're shot um, be in agricultural settings uh, because they're considered pest by some, and they're also shot for kangaroo leather. So that's how, um, that's how it all started. I got to know the kangaroos personally. And then a few years ago, uh, we just had, the, I was in Australia, 2019. It was the summer, it was very hot. And uh, bushfires just started all over the country, primarily from lightning strikes. And I watched every day as, you know, the number was something like over um, 50, 50 million acres uh, of land um, was, was burned and how the animals were just running everywhere and the kangaroos and the koalas were being burned and they couldn't run fast enough. Because one thing that people don't know about kangaroos is that uh, when they run from uh, fear, they get something called myopathy and their uh, muscles seize up. And so they can't, most of them could not outrun the fires. So it was a very devastating time. At the same time, I was working um, uh, as the director of international programs for the Center for Humane Economy and Animal Wellness Action. And Wayne and I started to talk about it. And it was his idea, it was his idea to um, talk and, and, and go in depth about the kangaroos aren't shoes and start that campaign. And, uh, and so we did because... More than anything, we realized at that moment with um, an estimated by science, science uh, scientists were estimating 3 billion animals died during those fires, and many of them kangaroos. And uh, it, it was time to address the situation uh, with kangaroos being used for their leather. The use of, of kangaroo leather or K leather, as it's euphemistically known, is really more predicated, I think, on nostalgia than efficacy, right? Because I know we did a comparison in last year's World Cup where we saw that that a disproportionate number of goals were accomplished with synthetic fiber shoes relative to goals scored by players who had donned uh, uh, kangaroo shoes. Am I right, Kate? You had something to do with that math, did you not? That was a little bit before my time, but I was involved in it. That was a former worker on our campaign. But as a senior attorney and um, head along with our general counsel of the kangaroo litigation we have going on in California, I was part and parcel of figuring out exactly how common kangaroo leather shoes are continuing to be in the soccer industry at large and especially in the professional world. So it does seem, Joseph, as you were alluding to, that as time goes on, kangaroo leather is no longer considered, at least by the professional soccer players around the world, the premier product it once used to be. And now that man-made synthetic products are getting better and more advanced, uh, kangaroo leather has really lost its stranglehold, so to speak, on the higher end or highest end tier of soccer cleats and soccer shoes, which is uh, a good thing for us um, that you know, synthetics have reached this point where uh, while we argue kangaroo leather was never necessary to begin with, it is certainly seems the case that soccer players also believe it is not necessary for their, uh, you know, per for the perfection of their sport, let's say. Uh -huh. Good good point. 
I, I think a lot of it goes back too to the fact that Pele, who is probably is is close to a deity in the soccer world as you can get, uh, it made a a famous commercial where he donned some kangaroo leather shoes, and many of the sports aspirants uh, wanted to mimic him in that regard, and and that seems to be somewhat tenacious in its hold on many of the people who purchase these shoes. Jennifer, before we got into recording, you mentioned you had some experience with the intelligence of kangaroos. I don't know. I don't even know if I've seen one at a zoo, right? I mean, I've seen the memes where you know, you've got these bulked up kangaroos that look like they could kick my ass. Of course, even Ryan looks like he could kick my ass. So, you know, that's not really saying much, but, uh, but, uh, but tell us a little, tell us a little bit about the animals. Well, I'll tell you, um, I had some friends who were farmers and, uh, and they rescued a joey. Uh, and in Australia, one of, the, one of the things that we do is when we see, um, uh, a, a kangaroo that has been killed on the road, most people I know, then pull over and check the pouch and pull the joey out of the pouch. Oftentimes, you know, if a kangaroo has been hit in the head, the joey's still alive. And so such came the case when I became a foster mother to a kangaroo. Um, And so I do have that personal experience. And um, it was like having a, you know, it was like having an intelligent dog hopping around the house with the dogs, uh, by the way. But, you know, I, I always, I want to express in a, in a, just a little story, just how beautiful they are and the connection to human beings they can have and do. Um, I, there, was a, there were some terrible fires in West Australia before the 2019 fires where a whole um, town burned down and, and they were fast moving. And I was told a, a shortly after by a wildlife care that she, she had packed up her house and she had had um, she had had joeys. A lot of people who live in the Australian bush are foster mothers to joeys. And so they take care and they feed these um, little guys and girls until they're about one years old. And then the other kangaroos will come and pick them up and start taking them off into the bush at night. But they, they come back. And they come back often uh, to show their, their foster parents when they have newborns. And so, so was the case where um, the fires were raging and this one woman was packing up her house and she put the dogs in the car and she looked around and, and down the, the road was hopping one of her joeys that she had raised and was now an adult. And, and the joey, and it, it actually was an adult, it wasn't a joey anymore, and got in the car with them, the, the, the animal had run to her mother to be saved from the fires. And I've never told that story before. I always thought, oh, I'll save that for one of the books <laughs> because it's so amazing. But this is the exact appropriate time for everyone to understand the relationship um, and and what a beautiful animal they are. A lot of people push back when I talk about this campaign and they say, well, what's the difference between you know killing a kangaroo for a shoe and a cow for a shoe or a boot or a glove or or whatever. And and certainly it would be inappropriate for anyone, I think, to say the value of the life of a kangaroo is more than the value of a life of a cow. It'd be there's someone there, there's sentience, there's emotion, mm-hmm. there there's mm-hmm. a lot going on. But but I think when we look at the lives these animals lead before they encounter man. It, we find another element of tragedy, just what you say right there, right? The, the notion that these are animals in the wild. They know better, right? They are accustomed to and still have as part of their their epigenetic makeup uh, the, the ability to interact with that world and then to suddenly and violently deprive them of even the basic humane standards afforded dairy cattle is what makes this to me a particularly egregious and wasteful exercise. What a what a great story, Jennifer. Well, thank you, thank you, and and you're a hundred percent right. And and the important thing to note here um, when we're talking about this is that Australia is an island, and uh, 
uh, these kangaroos are are really only on one island in the world. They're on a few just out on the outskirts of Australia. But, um, you know, uh, it's not sustainable when you put uh, a price on the head of wildlife uh, and there's a huge global market and there are a lot of people in this world, eventually uh, you extinct a species. And not only when we looked at the beginning of this campaign, we did we did research for a year. This didn't just pop up and we say, oh, we're gonna we're gonna do this. This was a long thought out process. When we started looking at the government rules, you know, um, and the government of Australia was telling uh, telling these corporations um, this is sustainable and it's humane. Well, there's nothing humane about the way these animals are taken down. Um, especially when we when we look at the the joeys that are collateral damage when their mothers are killed, and when we were looking into the government uh, rules as to how to kill, um, I'm reading them right now um, for the shooters, what we call shooters, um, the small furless pouch young. So those are the babies that are very very young. They don't have any fur yet. They're very pink and they're they're absolutely sweet eyes. You know, they are to uh, pull them out and with a single forceful blow to the base of the skull, uh, kill them. Um, if if the animal is, in, is furred in a pouch, which means it's probably more than a, a few months old, um, again, a single forceful blow to the base of the skull. So they say that, but what that means i.e. Australians, because I know a lot of Australians. I've talked to people who do this. They basically take the animals after their, and their mothers are dying often slowly, um, and they they hit them against a car to save the money for a bullet. So you have, you have that, and there's really not a lot that's humane about it because we've seen footage uh, time and time again that these animals are often left behind, and we have we have live foot, we have video uh, of little joeys holding onto their mothers, and they've just been left what's left of their mothers, excuse me, um, in the fields, and they're just holding on, and they're left to die on their own. They're left to die on their own because who wants to get all bloodied themselves um, by who wants to kill an infant? Who really wants to kill an infant? Uh, it'd be better just let them die on their own, or they'll say maybe a fox will get them or something. So there is nothing sustainable about um, basically eradicating a, the kangaroos from Australia, and there's definitely nothing humane about the way it's done. Jennifer, I think that's that's an interesting point too, because it connects further to the distinction between the raising and and harvesting of of, of beef cow. Uh, cattle, let's say, and kangaroos, right? So if a kangaroo is shot and, and the shooter is ineffective with this shot, then that animal escapes and dies, you know, a slow, painful death uh, out out in the outback, right? Uh, whereas at least in a more organized environment, if you will, you know, death can at least be sure to be comparatively quickly and hopefully comparatively painlessly. And then two, you don't have to worry in a in a domesticated animal environment of what's going to happen to the youngins. They, we, they they know what's going to happen, and they can much more easily and ostensibly humanely control that. And then regarding the potential for extinction, there there's no danger of extinction in a uh, animal husbandry environment uh, because they're going to make sure that. The, the species continues because there's, you know, it's in a controlled environment again and they can maintain uh, the numbers. So I think those are another set of key differentiators between why it's, in my opinion, morally wrong to kill any animal just for footwear or gloves, uh, but especially it's perhaps heinous when you talk about kangaroos. Kate? You know, and speaking of extinction, the kangaroos were endangered um, only about half a century ago. So it's helpful to remember that while some people believe that kangaroos are sustainable or can be sustainably harvested, 
Um, there is a real danger of them becoming extinct, uh, extinct again. And in the past 20 years, government studies from Australia itself show that the kangaroo populations have approximately decreased by half. So clearly, this is not the ever so sustainable practice that the government likes to claim it is. And Kate, isn't it the case that right now there are industries in Australia trying to develop a market for non-shoe products made from kangaroos, like meat and, you know, it's the kangaroo, it's it's what's for dinner version in Australia, right? It, there's there's a, a concerted effort to make more use of these animals. That's true. And I think Jennifer, being um, having lived in Australia uh, for so much time, can also speak to this. But kangaroo is a pretty common ingredient, major ingredient of pet food, not only dry pet food, but also in Australia, wet pet food, especially for dogs. You can even find it in the United States. There are um, essentially kangaroo uh, doggy kibble out there in the markets, and it's primarily marketed towards um, dogs with allergens to more common proteins since kangaroo is considered a novel protein. Of course, I would never want to deprive a dog of something it needs to exist, but there are plenty of other options that don't involve what is the largest uh the largest slaughter of terrestrial wild animals on the planet you know we think about the dolphins of the faroe islands we think about the seals in canada well we should think about the kangaroos of australia in exactly the same way and condemn this practice in exactly the same way but for some reason it doesn't it just hasn't quite caught on in the world um like the plight of the dolphins or the seals have um, but hopefully that will change, and that is our goal. Animal Wellness Action depends on people like you to complete our work. Our recent victories to protect big cats, spare beagles from pharmaceutical tests, and convince Nike to stop killing kangaroos for shoes would not have happened without the financial support of our donors. Become one today at any amount. Visit animalwellnessaction.org forward slash donate to join our fight against animal cruelty of all kinds. That's animalwellnessaction.org forward slash donate. Jennifer, let's say that your work and the work of Kate and others at Animal Wellness Action is successful. And we convince manufacturers never to make another soccer shoe out of a dead kangaroo. How many kangaroos will be, will be alive tomorrow as a result of that effort today? Well, that's a really good question. Um, number one, we're educating the public in Australia and around the world, and the government is changing. They're, they're realizing that they've really been overstepping quite a bit. So they are changing, and we are creating change in Australia. The, the question is a good one, because what happens um, is that when you close one market, uh, another will probably pop up because we are a very big world with lots of people. And I will tell you that I had a meeting with uh, leaders in Australia uh, last week, and we discussed um, next steps, emerging markets. So who will want to come in and grab up that kangaroo leather and do something with it? So we discussed, of course, China. And... Um, and so we get strategic and we are talking strategy right now about how to move our campaign, but more our educational campaign uh, toward Southeast Asia. And, you know, it's funny, you know, um, in our world, uh, we are and have been very effective over the past few years uh, with Animal Wellness and the Center for Humane Economy. And um, in the group I was talking to, they were concerned, you know, will we, would we ever be able to make any headway in China? You know, they're still eating dogs. I hear that a lot. Well, in 2020, April of 2020, the Chinese government, the, their, their agricultural department delisted dogs uh, for farming. That was huge. It was a huge moment. And it means that the voices of all the advocates and the compassionate people in the world were being heard. They did not want to see dogs being burned alive at Yulin. They didn't want to see it anymore. They didn't feel it was right, and it was not humane, and we told them, and they responded to that. So are we making change? Yes. 
Is there a chance that we can uh, shut down the global market for kangaroo leather? Absolutely. And we'll do it. No, good. I, I love your optimism. And I like, too, what you said about increasing awareness generally, because by focusing on something as common as a soccer shoe, you know, it's an increasingly popular sport. And maybe it's even behind the times to acknowledge that it is increasingly popular. It's so permeated in, in our culture right now. Uh, it, you know, we know kids who play soccer, right? So by focusing on a soccer shoe, I think it is encouraging the possibility that people will begin to think, well, gosh, is it in my dog food, right? Uh, where else might one find a misuse of a kangaroo and then begin to avoid these secondary products. Kate, what kind of numbers have we seen go in our direction since this campaign began? To start out with a caveat here, uh, it is difficult to know exactly what the numbers are because we're parsing through a lot of Australian governmental information um, that sometimes we're not sure about the precise accuracy of it and exactly how up to date it is. Just to use a quick example, after the momentous and horrible fires of a couple of years ago, the Australian government uh, post fire kangaroo data was not nearly as low as one would have expected, given the millions and millions of animals that died as a result of, as a result of those fires. So, all that being said, we're seeing so far in the past couple of years a reduction in the number or believed number of kangaroos killed from about 2 million to closer to 1.7 million, and the number of joeys being slaughtered in horrific ways from about 800,000 to closer to 500,000 or half a million. So we are seeing a reduction. I think it's probably as a result of our campaigns, growing awareness, the public pressure on companies like uh, Nike and Puma, and the company's response to that pressure. Nike and Puma in the past year have pledged to discontinue their use of K-Leather, as we mentioned um, earlier on in the podcast, and we're hoping to uh, continue the pressure on other companies like Adidas, like New Balance, like Mizuno, and other third-party retailers like Dick Sporting Goods, just to bring it back to our current campaign. That's a meaningful reduction. 300,000 Joeys spared from being long smashed against a truck bumper. That's really, that's really good news. Uh, Jennifer, tell us about the Don't Be a Dicks campaign. It's, it's very salacious. I'm, su I'm surprised as, as someone as prim and proper as you would come up with such a double entendre merely to accomplish a professional goal. I'm really disappointed in you. Oh, Joseph. Um, thank you. And uh, yes, we will absolutely give you credit for this. I actually think this is the most clever slogan uh, in, in a long time uh, seen by our organizations. And I thank you for that. It just says a lot. It just says everything, doesn't it? Without attacking someone, uh, attack attacking an organization in a mean-spirited way, without calling them names, it's really just uh, a very nice way of saying, look, you're doing something. Uh, you're profiting on something, <clears throat> the killing of animals uh, that is not humane, is not sustainable, and we're asking you to stop in a nice way. The leading, some of the leading right now, um, soccer cleat makers, they're, they're, they've said, okay, you're right. We didn't know. Let's just say, we didn't know. You've told us. Uh, you brought it to light. We're out. Um, so we're saying to Dix, look, look, guys, um, gals, we, you know better. Join, join us. You know, say, tell your customers you care. That's what we're saying. And I just, I do love slogan. <laughs> I can't help it. I walk around and it's, it's, I, I can't wait till everyone in the United States is saying it to their friends because we have used it in meetings now. We, we put out our, our press release announcing the campaign today and one of our distributors declined to, to publish it saying that it was a, a personal attack or a, an opinionated attack against 
you know, a, a business. And my response in trying to overturn their decision was, well, first of all, th there's not an opinion expressed in it. It is a fact that this store sells these shoes. And it is a fact that animal advocates find that distribution objectionable. And we went forward in my defense to say, uh, all we're, we're trying to do is raise public awareness. So we'll, we'll see if that decision is overturned in our favor with this distributor, but, um, it does seem to, it does seem to catch the ear, doesn't it? To, to, to call out some attention. It's like the best jingle that you had when you were a kid. Uh, it just stays with you. I can't wait for every, everyone on this, on this, uh, listening right now. I bet they're going to, it's going to get stuck in their head. Yeah, don't be a dicks. We want to. We want to make sure we say that, Jennifer. I'll I'll just allude to with with a smile on my face. Your first email about about this, where you said, "Don't be a dick." And I said, "Jennifer, it's don't be a dicks." <laughs> we got to we got to get that last that last part in. So we'll put a link to the video that Ryan played at the beginning of the show, as well as the protest one from the Adidas store, uh, in the show notes. Um, Ryan, who handles. Uh, ever so well, the social media and the content production for the organizations has, you know, a number of social media posts, all of which we hope will, uh, A, bring awareness, but also result in action. And there's a petition where individuals can go, we'll get the link, where they can sign their name in a zip code. Not a lot of information is asked. You don't have to provide your street address. No disgruntled Dick CEO employee will show up on your door in the dead of night with a flashlight uh, so that they we can present to Dick's, you know, a list of folks who say, hey, you know, you are the nation's largest sporting goods retailer. I love Dick's. Uh, it, it, whenever I need anything athletic. And, you know, Kate, when you look at me, you say, there's a guy who buys a lot of athletic stuff. You know, that's where I go. That's where I go. So uh, I, I don't have anything against the Knicks. I just think, as you said, Jennifer, I don't think they really, I don't think they really understand it. You know, they sell so many hundreds of thousands of, of SKUs, right? For them to investigate each and every one of them it would be, would be very, very difficult. Not impossible for an organization of their size, but very difficult. All we want to do with the Don't Be a Dicks campaign is say, hey, it, it's, it's 2023, right? You, you had the wildfires. The, these are terrific animals. Uh, they're they're shot. You know, we had a video we put up once a long time ago where someone in Australia had interviewed one of these hunters. And, and he almost was bragging about the docility of the kangaroo and uh, his ability to just kind of walk up and shoot him. It, it was horrifying to watch. I mean, it, it was just... It was so blithely evil as to chill me. So I think if we can educate dicks and the consumers a little bit more, then I think, you know, I think we're, I think we're off to a good, a good start. And I like doing dicks because as, as I said in my, my intro uh, notes, it's one thing for, for Adidas to say, well, all right, these people are coming to our stores, whatever, you know, it, it's, it's, we'll deal with it. But when shoppers at third parties begin to see what's going on and Dix, who has more sporting goods stores than anyone else in the United States, goes back to Adidas and New Balance and, and Mizuno, what, you know, we're not going to sell these anymore. We're getting too much collateral damage from it. Then maybe those manufacturers will, will back off. But consumer pressure is not the only thing we have going on. Kate, why don't you tell us about a new bill recently introduced into Congress and what we hope it will achieve? Recently in the 118th Congress, we have introduced a bill to prohibit certain activities involving kangaroos and kangaroo products. Um, essentially, the short title is the Kangaroo Protection Act of 2023. It was introduced by Representatives Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a Republican from Pennsylvania, and Jan Schakowsky, who's a Democrat from Illinois in the House of Representatives in the United States Congress. And that was in just uh, as recently as July of this year. Thank you, Kate. And people who go to animalwellnessaction.org and look for the Kangaroos Are Not Shoes campaign page or who go to kangaroosarenotshoes.org 
they'll be able to sign on or send a letter to not only their House representative, but to their senators as well to champion advancement of this legislation. I think a Senate counterpart to this bill is going to be introduced soon. So hopefully they'll both get momentum. Uh, they'll pass their respective chambers uh, and then and then head to President Biden's uh, desk. So thank you for for pointing that out. I'd like to add that. Thank you very much, Joseph, for for instructing people, you know, how to act. Um, we can't do this by ourselves. It just doesn't happen that way. And we need everyone who's listening today. Just the minute you get off listening to this podcast to go ahead and sign, sign up, please. Because, you know, two minutes later, you're onto something else, but this is really important. And it's important for us that you are on our team. It's a great feeling when we succeed. And when you know that you were part of that, it's just a happy moment in time. And we want you, we want you on board. So thank you very much in advance. I know it's super easy to do too. It takes just a couple of minutes. Jennifer's right. You know, I'm the worst at this. I have so many good intentions, but if I don't act on them in that moment, I'll never do it. You know, something else will catch my attention, squirrel, and I'll be off in another direction. Uh, and before you know it, I, I've, I've lost it and I, I'm, and I won't do it. Wayne Pacelli, our president, he goes to Capitol Hill quite a bit and he'll go in a lot of times and meet with legislators and say, holy cow, the, the number of emails I received from your people is amazing. And we know it makes a difference. It's how we were so effective last year when it came to passing the Big Cat Public Safety Act, when it came to passing FDA modernization. We, we have the idea, but really what we end up being is a lightning rod for the tremendous electricity of public sentiment on behalf of animals. And our ability to channel that is just a small part you guys, our listeners, are the ones who really, really make it happen. So, Jennifer, you segued into that very, very nicely. Um, what have I missed as we get to the end of our show? Kate, final thoughts from you. Dick's Sporting Goods has actually done an amazing job recently in responding to consumer concern about issues like single-use plastic bags. Uh, they have an eco-conscious public lands concept that I myself have purchased goods from. I'm I'm a sporting goods person for my, you know, I love my REI and my public lands and my uh, camping and whatnot. And um, it's disappointing to me that um, they just maybe overlooked the kangaroo shoes. But I'm very optimistic about Dick's Sporting Goods responding to this because they've responded to so many other important topics in the, you know, social uh, zeitgeist so far. So um, that's that's my final thought there. Yeah. And another thing. Ryan was just telling me the other day how he went to buy a new concealed carry nine millimeter and Dick's no longer s sells firearms, right? So that's further indicative yes. that this chain does try to do the right thing, right? So that that's very good. He ended up getting like a little 38 special, lost some guy on the street. So, but he tried to buy it at Dick's first. Jennifer, final thoughts from you. I want to thank you and Ryan and Kate. Uh, and all of our team at, at Animal Wellness Action, the Center for Humane Economy. And I want to thank everyone who supports the work that we do. So thank you. I just, I just love all of you. So thanks, everyone, for listening. I've been your host, Joseph Grove, and we'll be back soon with another episode of the Animal Wellness Podcast. Hey, Joseph, one more thing. Yes. Don't be a dicks. Thank you for listening to the Animal Wellness Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and follow Animal Wellness Action on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. To stay current with all of our news and information and to take action to help animals, sign up at animalwellnessaction.org. Until next time, remember that helping animals helps us all.